Um, so this morning, we're honored to be joined by Dr. Bruce Hubbard. So he's a, a PhD clinical psychologist um, who has really devoted his career to, um, to tinnitus. Um, so he um, himself has um, developed tinnitus and that kind of, from my understanding, shifted his, um, his clinical focus. Um, and now he's become a world-renowned expert on CBT for tinnitus. Um, so he currently is a visiting scholar at, at Columbia University. He has been the president um, in the past of the New York City Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Association, and he founded his own um, his own corporation or company called CBT for Tinnitus. Um, so he is board certified in, in um, cognitive and behavioral psychology, um, and, and I think we'll have a lot to learn from him today. So I'm excited to, to hear this talk and um, excited to hear what we can learn from you. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Let me get my screen share going. Um, I've known of the House Clinic for many, many years. I'm sure we've worked with mutual patients in the past. Um, is that, you have that okay, Susan, the screen share? Yes, it looks great. Okay, okay good. Um, let me just move this over here. Okay. Um, so I'll start by explaining quickly. Yes, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm kind of an unusual profession to have. Uh, in, the, in a world of uh, a hearing problem, an auditory problem like tinnitus. Um, as Susan said, I developed tinnitus uh, when I was 45, I was 19 years ago, uh, and it was life-changing for me. I really was one of those patients you all know who, uh, when, you, when, when the, uh, the doctor said, uh, I'm sorry, there's no treatment, you'll get used to it, would refuse to leave the office and get pushed and come on there, must be something else we can do. Um, but I went from being severely distressed about it for several months to just on my own, again, it's 19 years ago, stumbling on uh, uh, some reports of CBT for tinnitus through my own library research to try to understand what was going on, what I could do about the problem. And that was eye-opening for me. I had been a, a cognitive behavioral psychologist for 15 years already. It's been my passion since college. So as soon as I saw, oh, you, you can use CBT for this, it clicked for me. I knew what I had to do. I started feeling better pretty quickly. And within a couple of years, I was fully habituated. And that was 17 years ago, and I maintained that habituation. So uh, I am a big proponent for this approach and for taking a habituation perspective on uh, tinnitus. Um, uh, I want to start by just clarifying some terminology because you'll see these different ways of describing cognitive behavior therapy. So it's called cognitive behavior therapy. Often it's called cognitive behavioral therapy or simply CBT. We're talking about the same thing. Um, I'll go into more detail about it, but cognitive behavior therapy is science-based, evidence-based behavioral health treatment. I see this as in the mental health world, there's psychopharmacology, which is an evidence-based treatment for emotional challenges uh, and cognitive behavior therapy. And those are the two areas that really are dedicated to providing a more scientific evidence-based approach to mental health. Um, so CBT stands out in the world of uh, uh, tinnitus. Uh, it's an, the only uh, evidence-based treatment for tinnitus. Now, some people, recently are suggesting uh, sound therapy, in particular tinnitus retraining therapy is evidence-based, but the if you look at the, and I do turn to the uh, otolaryngology guidelines, tinnitus guidelines that were published in 2015, which I think are excellent. I turn to those fairly often as a source of uh, evidence uh, review, uh, and, and they're mixed in their review of sound therapy. The uh, evidence uh, for efficacy is mixed. They uh, warn of uh, instilling false hope and getting people involved in a, uh, uh, a very pricey approach to handling tinnitus. So it may be just as a TRT, specifically if it's done according to the uh, original protocol, may be as effective as CBT. We don't know at this point. CBT seems to be the best thing we have. Um, uh, the, so the only problem really with cognitive behavior therapy, and we'll talk quite a bit more about this, is getting quality CBT to the people with tinnitus who need it. Uh, while there are uh, approximately a dozen uh, well-controlled uh, out clinical outcome studies showing it, it significantly helps reduce tinnitus distress, 
Um, there are very, very few people like me who understand this. Uh, I went through six years of graduate training in a CPT-based doctoral program, 15 years of uh, professional practice, and until my tinnitus started, I had never heard of this. So it's not something that we get as a routine part of our training at all. Um, we call this in my field where there's an evidence base that indicates this is a good treatment for a problem, but there's a uh, no one delivering that in uh, uh, standard uh, clinical practices. We call that an evidence to practice gap. I'm sure it exists in otolaryngology as well. With tinnitus, it's an evidence to practice chasm. Uh, the best, again, the best treatment or the, or certainly one of the best options is CBT, and it's very hard to access. Um, so what is cognitive behavior therapy for tinnitus? Well, um, first of all, I do want to clarify that there is an older approach, uh, we'll call uh, traditional CBT, um, that focuses on, and I'm sure some of you have heard this, uh, defines CBT as change your thinking to change how you feel and behave. And with that old model, which really reached its peak in the 1990s, uh, a good 80, 90% of the focus of treatment was on changing your thinking, uh, on tracking automatic negative thoughts, identifying distortions and correcting them, challenging them. Um, what we found by the end of the 1990s is that if you break the treatments down between their cognitive and their behavioral components, the cognitive components are not really worthy of that level of, uh, of feature. Um, so the, the, the behavioral components were in many cases much, much more effective or at least equally effective. They kind of, the cognitive and behavior worked hand in hand. Um, so uh, we'll talk uh, about uh, how we use it. Still, cognitive uh, interventions are still very important. We'll talk about how to use those effectively and how to integrate them effectively with the uh, uh, behavioral components of CBT. Um, uh, CBT can most rightly be understood as a family of cognitive behavioral therapies. And I don't want to get too complicated in this, but just like in uh, medical practice, there may be a number of evidence-based approaches for a particular problem. Um, and so it's the doctors uh, uh, has to make the decision about where they're going to specialize and what they're going to apply. Um, the, there are a number of common principles that unite these therapies. Uh, we rely on the biopsychosocial model. Um, as psychologists in CBT, we, our responsibility is the psychological end. Uh, so CBT treatments are focused on a person's psychological response to the problem, how they think act and and I say act or take action we often use that language now instead of uh, uh, referring to behavior um, and this is very significant and a very important part of uh, cognitive behavior modern cognitive behavior therapy is how we pay attention to the problem aspects and this uh, uh, comes up in the form of what's called mindfulness which some of you may be familiar with uh, which has become an integral part of modern cognitive behavior therapy. Um, cognitive behavior therapy should better be called uh, cognitive behavioral attentional therapy. <clears throat> like medical intervention, uh, development of CBT approaches is ongoing and reflects developments in the science. The effectiveness of CBT is demonstrated through carefully controlled studies. Um, CBT strategies are used to change our psychological response, uh, and, and th this uh, change is embodied in practical skills that can be learned and applied to address the problem. Uh, we really, you can think of CBT as an efficient and short term because it's really a self-help approach. We're really teaching the patient how to uh, understand the problem, what are the key concepts they need to be aware of, and what are the strategies they can use to initiate the improvement. Um, and then our job is to make ourselves obsolete, to be able to pull back. The patient now knows what to do and can continue that with uh, no contact or minimal contact and coaching from the therapist. Um, 
so again, the family of cognitive behavior therapies are used to, to treat a number of problems that are, co are, are commonly related to tinnitus distress. Um, and I'm sure you've come across some of these. I would say the, the most uh, significant uh, in my experience is health anxiety, generalized anxiety. And health anxiety, a person uh, uh, becomes almost has a phobic reaction to a particular problem in their body. So you can imagine the kinds of problems that occur with tinnitus and not just tinnitus, but related conditions like hyperacusis, um, which often are unexplained. They're sort of mysteries to people. Those, that is the exactly the kind of uh, 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 fuel for the what if thinking that can generate a person's uh, catastrophic uh, worry. Um, and certainly uh, with tinnitus distress, it can peak to the level of panic. Uh, there's, a, a, as you all well know, a, a significant amount of insomnia uh, and so on. Um, uh, the family, so the, here is the family of, of the family of cognitive behavior therapies. These are the approaches that have been shown through controlled research to help with tinnitus. Traditional cognitive behavior therapy, which I had referred to earlier, that focuses largely on the cognitive part, but I would assume because that breakdown's never been done, uh, that uh, the cognitive part is not as important as the behavioral part, or there's more of a balance there. Um, and this was developed uh, originally in the 1990s during the heyday of traditional cognitive behavior therapy. Um, but there has been uh, considerable research and development into these more modern areas of cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, one such approach is called acceptance and commitment therapy. This is very different. There's almost no attention put on changing your thinking at all. Instead, you learn to identify the thoughts that interfere with your progress. The, the thoughts that are un, unhelpfully uh, trigger a lot of anxiety, unwanted uh, emotion and, uh, and dysfunction. And you get better at ignoring those thoughts while keeping your attention. This is very focused on, again, the commitment to taking action to improve your situation. And I use this a lot with my tinnitus patients. Uh, and then there's an approach called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which if some of you are familiar with John Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness-based stress reduction, it's based on that, but it's used really to help people accept the emotions and the uh, 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 ruminative thinking and worry that comes up with anxiety and depression. So these are the CBT approaches that have been shown to significantly reduce tinnitus distress. And just looking at this, it uh, uh, can be a little overwhelming. Um, so my job here is to distill this down into its basic components as can be applied to uh, tinnitus distress. So I'm calling this a best practice approach. And if you look up best practice uh, for any field, um, it's professional procedures that are accepted as being correct or most effective. So I am taking on that mantle and stepping out and saying, I believe these are those features. So change your thinking. Uh, this uh, part of cognitive behavior therapy is based on age old wisdom. We certainly did not make this up or, or much of what we do. Um, we've really just distilled it into practical form for people. Um, but this is the idea that goes back to the ancient Greeks uh, uh, that how we think about a problem and a situation, how what we believe about it, how we understand it can exert a strong influence over how we feel and behave. Um, and uh, so with tinnitus, there uh, it, again, once someone has gone through their medical evaluation um, and the physician has concluded it, you know, basically, it's not secondary to any medical problem that can be identified and, and addressed. It's, you know, what we call primary tinnitus. It's likely to be persistent. It very likely may not go away. Um, then there are two, and there's no treatment. There are basically two approaches, uh, ways of thinking about it that people with tinnitus fall into. One I call the control perspective. The control perspective goes like this. 
I have this sound in my head and whatever related con untreatable related conditions, hyperacusis, for example, I have this sound in my head. There's no treatment for it. It's driving me nuts now. Because there's no treatment, I will always feel this bad moving forward. And you can imagine that perspective, that view, that belief really triggers a tremendous amount of anxiety and ultimately depression as the person keeps attempting to control their tinnitus through diet, supplements, et cetera, and fails at that. We're taking in my program what I call a habituation or a recovery perspective that goes like this. Most people, and if you look at random surveys of the general population, this is true, most people are not bothered by their tinnitus. Uh, so, uh, and so e even if the tinnitus doesn't go away, even if in fact it gets louder, because that's a major fear of people once tinnitus starts, that it's just, just gonna get louder. I can be okay because I can learn uh, coping strategies to deal with it more effectively, to be able to function more effectively and to promote habituation. So as, as example, again, me as an example of tens of millions of people in this country right now, I'm one of the, you know, it, it, I would describe it as it bothered me a lot at first, but I got used to it. So that's what CBT should be focused on, is helping people uh, get a grip, move on, and uh, if possible, fully habituate. Um, I'm going to skip a little, little of this for time purposes. Um, we uh, So in order to develop a uh, healthy, effective perspective on, on tinnitus, um, we do review uh, some information, some facts about tinnitus, and unlike a lot of the audiology programs, I also incorporate facts about emotion because it's really, honestly, the emotional reaction more, I believe, in many cases than the tinnitus itself that leads to the pain and dysfunction. Um, we talk in modern CBT, I, I, as you saw, one of the uh, for approaches, evidence-based approaches is acceptance and commitment therapy. And that's an approach where, along with mindfulness, where you, whenever you're facing a problem, it, it could be your boiler is broken in your house, you step back and you ask, what can and can't I gain control over? And uh, what am I going to have to accept here? And what can I change? Where, where can I roll up my sleeves and exert some, some change? So that's a, a important place to start in terms of helping a person change their thinking about tinnitus. So here's a sheet I use, a uh, worksheet I use with people. So the fact of tinnitus, the existence of tinnitus, the untreatability in 99% of uh, cases of tinnitus, that's something we need to accept and learn how to make peace with. Um, hearing our tinnitus uh, that is something that through habituation can get easier, significantly easier over time. It can take a while, but again, using myself as an example, I went from hearing my bike, I mean, just zeroing in on it 100% of my waking day, and I swear if I got to sleep, it would wake me up at night, uh, to being oblivious to it. I, it's, tinnitus hasn't changed at all. I'm sitting in this quiet office. I'm turning my attention to it now only because I'm talking about not being aware of it. Um, but it, it's blaring. My tinnitus is fairly loud. But I know within seconds, I'm going to forget about it again. Um, and that, again, is something I want people to have faith in, that they can learn how to, even if they don't get to that level, I'm fortunate, I'm fully habituated, approximate that level of habituation. And the same with feeling anxious about tinnitus and the other emotions that come up around it. We do expect that over the course of CBT, uh, even at long after the, the CBT sessions stop and a person continues to apply the practice, uh, their awareness of tinnitus and their distress will gradually go down. Um, and then here's what we can directly change. Getting caught up in negative thinking, gloom and doom thinking, negative attention, focusing on everything that's awful about tinnitus and avoiding important areas of your life because you're afraid they'll make your tinnitus worse. Um, 
And, and then I, you, I distill this uh, into, because, well, let me back up. These strategies are only as helpful as a person's ability to apply them when they need them. So in cognitive behavior therapy, again, which is really a, a, almost like a supportive workshop, we take a learn, practice, apply approach. So the recovery statement is how I help people apply their better thinking about tinnitus to keep it top of mind. So here's an example from one of my tinnitus patients. Uh, of the, they, this is kind of how they've summarized their better thinking, having gone through this process of learning the facts, uh, 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 flexibly evaluating their own negative, worried, scared, dark thinking about tinnitus. Here's what they've come away with that they remind themselves about on a regular basis when they start to slip over into the dark side. If I continue to view tinnitus as the bane of my existence, it will never go away. I can't stop these sounds. And by go away, they mean become not unaware of them. I can't stop these sounds and sensations, but I can change how I respond. I can allow the sounds to be present, even if I don't want them, and courageously move forward into my life. Tinnitus is not going to win. There's a big element of that, of I'm in charge, not this sound in my head. I can be reassured by the facts that vast number of people have gone on to accept and habituate to their tinnitus. I will adjust and get my life back. So here I go. <clears throat> so equally, if not more important, as I've said, um, in cognitive behavior therapy is changing our behavior. Um, now, some cognitive behavior therapists, and this goes back to that old CBT from the 1990s, uh, in the tinnitus world, still focus on breathing and relaxation techniques to handle anxiety, and they call that the behavioral component. That's in fact been shown to be a very weak intervention for the kinds of distress, anxiety that comes up with tinnitus. Um, so we really focus much more now on uh, uh, the idea that feelings follow behavior. This is, you can think of this as the old, just do it, fake it till you make it. But the way I, I describe this is behave like yourself again so you can feel like yourself again. And it will be, there will be a lag. You'll be pushing yourself to engage in things uh, and, and, and the feelings will come later. Um, but, it, but you know, to stick with this, if you just sit around the house ruminating about your tinnitus, you avoid all of the important areas of your life because of tinnitus, you're not going to get any better. Um, I want to make the distinction in the tinnitus community, often uh, practitioners talk about distraction, get distracted. We don't think about it that way. We think about it in terms of engagement. It's not just getting distracted by a puzzle or getting to work or going to an event with your child. Try to really focus on getting absorbed in that event. Don't let tinnitus sidetrack you the entire time you're there. Um, and also, again, instead of pleasurable, relaxing activities and so on, we put a big focus now uh, on values-directed action, values-directed behavior. For example, uh, a woman might choose to, uh, who's struggling with tinnitus, may choose to work late at night to stay at the office, work late, even though she's hearing her tinnitus. Uh, to uh, be better prepared for a presentation the next day than to leave work early and get a massage. We would consider that much, much more valuable for her, much more bang for the effort that she puts into her, uh, her behavior. Um, and we use a lot of graded exposure in cognitive behavior ther therapy to help people uh, recover from uh, severe emotional reactions. Um, so, for example, if somebody is hiding out in their house, afraid to go out and function because they're going to be hearing their tinnitus, they're afraid events are going to be even, I, I'm talking about phonophobia, where people actually become uh, irrationally af afraid of safe levels of sound. Um, for example, going to your favorite restaurant, people will avoid that, believing that it's too loud, it's, it's going to permanently uh, damage my hearing and make my tinnitus worse. We use graded exposure to help people uh, armed with their better thinking. And I'll, I'll talk about mindfulness in a moment, which is another applied skill. 
um, enter into these situations. They'll do it a little at a time. You can think of it as strength training in a gym. You start with the weight that's right for you. You do that regularly. Every week you add a little more and that way you can uh, develop a greater strength. Um, and in this case, people develop greater emotional muscle. The confidence that they can be okay while hearing their tinnitus in these settings and that these settings are not going to uh, damage their tinnitus, uh, damage their hearing or make their tinnitus worse. Uh, obviously, there are some settings that are sufficiently loud. We need to be concerned and that's part of the program too. Um, so I do always take people through a quick course in uh, hearing protection. Um, I go over the decibel level chart with them and help them. I use the old uh, maxim that uh, I was taught by uh, a, a audiologist, a colleague of mine years back, that if it's if it's sufficient, the setting sufficiently loud, you have to shout to have a conversation. Then you need to be concerned. Um, so change your attention, mindfulness. Again, I've referred to this as being a integral part of modern cognitive behavior therapy, the attentional component of cognitive behavior therapy. Um, mindfulness is used uh, to soften a person's response to tinnitus, to soften their perception of tinnitus, and to help them broaden their attention out to the other sounds and sensations that are present. Um, uh, so mindfulness, I, some of you probably know this, but mindfulness is ancient meditation technique. It's Buddhist meditation. We're not coming at it from any kind of religious or spiritual standpoint. It was introduced into the health sciences in the 1990s, and there are literally thousands of studies showing that it helps in many, many different areas of medicine and, and mental health. Um, and and how does it uh, achieve this uh, all right, it's, so it's it's used in the health sciences for to help people accept and adapt to these unwanted realities like tinnitus, the things that they desperately don't want, but there's no treatment so they can't get rid of them. Chronic pain, persistent illness, uh, 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 body restrictions, uh, and, and it, it's really, really helpful with tinnitus. And again, there are some good controlled studies uh, of the cognitive uh, uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, as I said, that show this really helps. This was a game changer for me when I learned how to practice uh, mindfulness of sound. So mindfulness of sound, it turns out, is a traditional mindfulness strategy. Um, so by the way, let me just say, it, it, I, you often hear people say, well, mindfulness is helpful with tinnitus, meditation is helpful. You need to teach the person how to meditate with tinnitus. I couldn't do it. And I had been a, a daily meditator for 10 years when my tinnitus started. And I could not sit down in a quiet room. I was too emotionally overwhelmed by hearing my tinnitus. So I had to learn how to do it. So the trick, what makes mindfulness helpful in softening our, our experience of these unwanted aspects of our, our big lives is practicing a particular type of attention that's present centered. You're really courageously going with whatever's coming up now um, it, it, and non-judgmental, whether you like it or not you're going to be open and accepting of it. It takes a lot of courage to do this with pain and, and illness and, and with tinnitus. Um, so it, it, I learned that it's best done in the context of a mindfulness of sound. So again, this is a traditional mindfulness exercise where a person will sit down and allow themselves to pay attention to whatever ambient sound is present. And guess what? For a lot of us, that's tinnitus and other head noise. Um, so you're bringing this on a regular basis. I encourage people to practice 20 minutes a day, bringing this present-centered, non-judgmental attention to their tinnitus and to other sound that's present. And as I said, to help them practice decentering the, their attention on the tinnitus and focusing on other sounds while, and here's the key, allowing themselves to hear the tinnitus. This is just tremendous set of skills that they're developing. So when they sit down to do their work or go to a baseball game with their child or uh, 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 go, go to sleep at night, 
Um, they're able to hear their tinnitus more effectively without getting pulled into all the negative thinking and the judgments uh, and the wishes that it would stop. Um, so we also uh, use mindfulness. As I said, I'm going to, again, these strategies in CBT are only as effective as a person's ability to use them when they need them. So just like uh, the, the uh, flexible thinking, uh, having your recovery statement, helping that motivate you to engage in courageous behavior, to engage in the uh, values directed actions and so on that you've been avoiding, mindfulness is used to facilitate that process as well. Um, so I, I call this, we call this mindful movement or mindful engagement where you will enter into a setting, allowing your tinnitus to be there, working to not get pulled into the negative thoughts and judgments about it and broadening your attention to what you need to focus on to engage effectively in that situation. <clears throat> and then uh, we know that only about a, a, maybe a fifth or a quarter of people become significantly distressed by their tinnitus when it starts. Again, this is a kind of an odd thing that uh, not everyone is affected emotionally as, as, as the others. Um, so we ask the question, why? What's different about me that I had such a strong negative reaction to tinnitus while I, I'm a, a musician? I'm, I can go and talk about that for a long time. I'm sure that that contributed to my tinnitus. I have other musician friends with tinnitus that seems louder than mine, and they're like, eh, I don't know, it bugged me at first, but I got used to it. It's no, but never any big deal. It's just tinnitus, right? So what are the vulnerability factors that made it so hard for me and for others? Um, and some of them we know there is a high level of anxiety and insomnia, history of anxiety and depression. And if you already have those tendencies toward, oh, I'm sorry about the abbreviation, that means worst case scenario worst case scenario thinking. If you have that tendency to jump to negative conclusions about things, particularly with your body, that's going to set you up to fall into a negative uh, place with tinnitus. Um, and this was me too, people who place a high value on sound and, si and silence. You hear that a lot. I've lost my silence. Um, so it, that, and for me, that was really devastating. In fact, I I'm an outdoors guy. One of my favorite things is to be out in the middle of, of the forest and just hear the sounds of the forest. I'm sitting in my New York City apartment, I was devastated by the fact that I had tinnitus and would never enjoy that again. By the way, through habituation, it's not an issue. Um, and I, I, I'm going to step out here also and say, I don't believe stress causes tinnitus. I know you see people refer to stress-induced or anxiety-induced tinnitus. I've treated thousands of people with anxiety. Nobody ever complained of tinnitus. By the way, I've treated thousands of people who have been on antidepressant medications. Nobody ever got tinnitus. Um, the, so, but having a high general stress level when tinnitus starts, I, and just the usual candidates, right? Kids, family, work other health problems, et, et cetera. Um, you just have less left over to cope with and adjust to your tinnitus. It just makes it a lot harder to have tinnitus. Um, and there are, and I see tinnitus as a common problem of aging. Um, I have some charts I decided not to include, but if you can see my hand, uh, it kind of, you know how this works. It's highly associated with high frequency hearing loss. It's probably in most cases starts with damage in the, uh, the cochlea um, that could be just wear and tear over decades of listening to stuff. Um, but you see that uh, it's pretty level through age 40. Once you hit 40, that's when it starts to go up, the incidence of high frequency hearing loss and the onset of tinnitus. So I very much view this, not in every case for sure, but in many cases as a problem of aging. And there are lots of other problems of aging that can dovetail with tinnitus onset, like retirement, 
like menopause, uh, other medical problems that come up, an empty nest. I see a lot of people with empty nest syndrome where, you know, if I had stuff to do for my kids, I'd be distracted from my dinners, but now I'm just sitting around the house listening to it. Um, and then I've referred to habituation a few times uh, so far. Um, and as somebody who's fully habituated with tinnitus, again, it's an full habituation is a cure, guys. I couldn't care less about my tinnitus. If somebody generated a legitimate treatment tomorrow, honestly, I probably at this point wouldn't bother. So now not everybody may be capable of reaching that level of habituation, but I think most are. And I've got a good track record in coaching my uh, tinnitus patients through that process to get to that point. So I'm a firm believer that any tinnitus treatment program should have at its core training in, in what habituation is and how to promote it. Um, just quickly, we talk a lot about the perceptual adjustment to tinnitus. There's all, right, where, where it's just that process of the brain gradually learning tinnitus is not important and weaving it into the, the background soundscape, the, the business as usual soundscape. But there's an emotional adjustment that's more important in my opinion that really can interfere with the perceptual adjustment. Um, accepting something you resist with every fiber of your being, that is an emotional adjustment. Forgiving yourself if you believe your behavior caused the problem, I, that was me. I really looked back on my years of playing in rock bands with unprotected hearing and kicked myself. I had to get to a point of forgiving myself and accepting that, th that this occurred and can't be changed. Forgiving others you believe may have caused the problem. Learning how to handle anxiety and insomnia for the first time. Recovering from the shame that you can't just snap out of it like your, your neighbor who got tinnitus and said it was no big deal. Um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, who's qualified to provide cognitive behavior therapy. So, you know, as we said, there's this evidence to practice gap. There are very few people like me worldwide who are uh, le le legitimate you know, highly trained, experienced cognitive behavioral psychologists or therapists um, who also have taken an interest in helping people with tinnitus. Um, as I said, I, I didn't learn about this. I, I'd been in the, in the CVT field for over 20 years, and I didn't, had not learned about this. Um, so there's a lack of qualified experts, and in this void, uh, non-qualified pe people are scrambling to fill the void and kind of capitalize on the need. But unfortunately, there are some programs available now, some self-help programs and pe people claiming to provide CBT who are just not qualified. Um, this is coming up with audiology to some, some extent. Um, this is an article that was published last year by a colleague of mine, Jim Henry, uh, out in Oregon. This is an excellent article where they really review th this problem. And their conclusion is that um, it's not appropriate for audiologists to provide cognitive behavior therapy. In order to provide cognitive behavior therapy, it takes years of training and experience, and it's done in the context of psychotherapy. So you've really got to be a mental health professional and have that supervised training and background in order to do this correctly. What we need to do is come up with, and again, I'm, I'm leaning toward Jim's work here and his colleagues to uh, coming up with a set of uh, stress management strategies that may be simple and superficial that audiologists can apply, say, in the context of tinnitus retraining therapy to give their uh, patients some uh, relief, patients who have milder levels of tinnitus distress. So what can you do as physicians? Um, well, you can certainly, and, and I, I was telling Susan, I should have included here uh, there. I, again, I don't know how you do it at the house clinic. In my, uh, I saw it, uh, an otolaryngologist who then when I pushed him, referred me to a neurotologist. Um, and neither one of them uh, screened my level of distress. Neither one of them screened me for a uh, clinical levels of anxiety, insomnia, or depression in order to refer me to the right help. 
Um, I think it's super important to do that. I'm working with the American Tinnitus Association now to develop a similar uh, protocol that audiologists can uh, apply to uh, not just a screen for tinnitus distress using the tinnitus handicap inventory of the tinnitus functional index, which are, are great measures, um, but take it a step further. If those people blow a high score, then let's see if they really need, uh, we need to bring in a mental health professional. Um, so it really is, again, a mental health professional, as I've indicated, who uh, is qualified to uh, treat somebody's tinnitus distress. I, again, I think at lower levels, it's okay, and self-help materials may be uh, sufficient, but at more moderate and certainly severe levels of, uh, of, uh, of, of emotional uh, disorder, of anxiety primarily, and insomnia, you re really, the patient deserves to see a qualified professional and get the right treatment. And I have an article coming out in the uh, American Tinnit Association magazine uh, any day now on this topic. Um, so, and ideally, of course, you would want to develop a network of providers who are experienced in treating the stuff of tinnitus distress, anxiety, insomnia, depression. It would not be a mental health professional who specializes in attention deficit disorder. That's not going to help us. Um, now, and now I'm really reaching, okay? If you can find, develop a network that meets the above criteria, that would be fantastic. If they are certified in cognitive behavioral therapies, that would be even better. Um, the two certification agencies are the Academy of Cognitive Therapy and the American Board of Professional Psychology. Um, and this is really icing on the cake. Uh, if you can find, I mean, look, I'm a believer that I wouldn't, would never take tennis lessons from a teacher who's never been on a tennis court. If you can find a professional who's experienced in uh, both uh, treating these problems and has fully recovered from tinnitus distress. God love you. Um, so there are some self-help resources. As I mentioned, there, in my strong professional opinion, are a number of resources currently available that are coming out now that are developed and provided by people who just are not qualified cognitive behavioral specialists. They're doing it incorrectly. They're kind of scrambling again to fill the void. I'm not going to call those people out specifically, but there's quite a bit of that going on right now, not just in the audiology community, but just business people who I think are looking to, uh, to make, make a profit. Um, there is a book that I do recommend. Um, unfortunately, these authors went with an academic publisher. I don't know why. Uh, so the book is very pricey. It's a, it's a excellent workbook, very thorough, more up to date than any of the other resources out there. Uh, it was uh, uh, co-authored by uh, 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 Gerhard Anderson, who's a Swedish psychologist who did much of the seminal uh, research on CBT for tinnitus. Um, and, uh, and then the, I believe Victor Caldo is a psychologist and then two audiologists, a PhD level audiologist. Again, they've done a really excellent thorough job. The book costs about a hundred dollars. I'll apologize for them, but it's really worth every penny as a self-help resource. If you're interested as a, a professional who uh, works with tinnitus, if you're an audiologist, this is the way to get the most up-to-date best uh, knowledge base. Um, thank you. That's my talk for this morning. <laughs>